December 7th came on a Monday this year. In fact, it was this past Monday. December 7th is an important date in American history. In fact, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt described December 7th as a day that will live in infamy. On December 7th, 1941, Japanese pilots carried out a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, leaving a path of destruction in their wake. Some 2,500 people, soldiers and civilians, lost their lives in that attack. Congress gave swift approval for the United States' involvement in World War II. It is described as the deadliest war that the world has ever known. It's believed that some 80 million people died in World War II. Now, if that number is correct, given the population of the world at that time, it's very well that it could be that 5% of the world's population died during World War II, 5% of the population at that time. Now, over the years, I've discovered and studied various aspects of the war. Over recent years, one of the things that's caught my attention is to study more about German concentration camps. One of the things, in all fairness, that I've really struggled with is to see how one group of people could have such hatred and disdain for another group of people. I simply just don't understand that. My heart breaks for the millions who lost their lives at those German concentration camps. I think the phrase that is used, those that were responsible when they were brought to to trial, to face charges for this. I think the the phrase that is used for this really is a a great description of of what we're looking at when they use the phrase crimes against humanity. I think that's a significant phrase. Now, I've studied about German concentration camps, but there's a powerful story about Japanese concentration camps that I actually want to share this morning to to introduce our lesson for the day. It's a story about a particular Japanese concentration camp under the command of a Japanese officer by the last name of Kanishi. Kanishi had a reputation of being ruthless, of being brutal, a torturer. Uh, One of the horrible things that he did, just an example, was to starve people for days and weeks until they were hungry. And then he would, he would give them food. And in this case, the story that I read is he would give them rice. And this rice had shells around it. And those shells had razor sharp edges. But he wouldn't give the prisoners any way to try to, to open that, to be able to get the rice out of that. But they were so hungry by this point that they would just take that shell and all and eat it. With those razor sharp edges, it would just cause significant internal damage and lead to death. That's the kind of picture that we have when we think about uh, how ruthless and just brutal and, and just a, a really an evil man that Kanishi was. It finally reached a point where Kanishi determined that he was going to go ahead and just kill off all of the, re- the rest of the prisoners in that concentration camp. And the date that he set to do that was February 24th, 1945. But before he could carry out that evil scheme, American troops went in and liberated that concentration camp. Those troops were under the direction of General Douglas MacArthur, and they came in on February 23rd, 1945. The lives of those remaining prisoners were spared, but Kanishi was able to escape and disappear. The search for him continued for a number of years and he was finally uh, discovered, arrested, and tried. They they found him uh, working as a gardener in a golf club in the Philippines. He was tried, he was convicted, he was sentenced to hang as a result of his crimes against humanity. But right before he was put to death, Kanishi made this statement that just left everyone jaw dry. He said, I believe and I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question that was asked of him is, well, how did you come to know Christ? And this was his explanation. 
He said that he watched the way that tortured Christians responded. He looked at the way that the people were responding, what they said and what they did, how they acted, at some of the most horrible times in their lives. And it made an impact on Kanishi. Did it make an eternal impact? on? Well, let's do this. Let's leave that job of judgment up to God, shall we? But I'm amazed when I look and I think about how horrible this man was. The things that he did of how brutal and devastating of how he just caused such pain and suffering in the lives of people. But he too was impacted by Jesus just simply by watching the way that people responded in time of suffering. Now to be honest with you, I almost didn't share that story today. And the reason is, is because we are at a time that I'm looking at our society, and our society is so filled with anger and division. It's at every corner. And one of the things that we have hoped to do in this series, and it's the reason that I ultimately shared the story with you to lead into our lesson today. And there's a couple of things that we have to come to. We have to believe as we study and as our hope is renewed, we have to believe that Jesus can change us. We have to believe that Jesus can change us. I'm reminded, and we've talked about this before, of people that will come to church, will come back to church, or that will come to Christ. And the statement that they might make is this. There's no way that God could forgive me for what I've done. And when people make a statement like that, I always respond now, if that's what you believe, then you don't know Jesus. Because Jesus can change us. Jesus can wipe away our sin. And that's important for us to know and us to understand. But this second thing is just as important. Do we believe in the power of the gospel message? Do we believe in the power of Jesus? To believe that that message, to believe that Jesus can change others. Even someone as evil and as ruthless as that Japanese commander, Kanishi. Do we believe that? And here's why that's important for us. Not because of the Japanese concentration camp, but because of the anger and division that we see in almost every corner. Because there are times that there's part of it that we just want to think that that the world is just wasting away before our very eyes. But friends, we need to remember that Jesus can change us and that the power of the gospel of Jesus can also change the world. The gospel of Christ is a life-changing message. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter as we continue our study today. What I want us to do today is really just to walk through, um, not even just verse by verse, but almost phrase by phrase of a passage in 1 Peter chapter 2. As we prepare to do that, can I remind us of this? That when Peter wrote this letter, he wrote this to a group of Christians that by his own terminology were scattered throughout the land. And the reason that they were scattered is because they were being persecuted. In fact, this topic, this idea of persecution is discussed in every chapter of 1 Peter. It just continues to come up. And Peter addresses that. He addresses the fact that they're scattered. He addresses the fact that they're persecuted. He desires to renew their hope in the power of the gospel, the gospel to change their lives, and the opportunity that they have to impact others with the gospel of Jesus. I mean, we've got to see that. We've got to know that when we let our light shine for Christ, of the potential for change that is all around us, never underestimate, friends, because you may sit there and think, well, he can't use me. Yes, we do. We believe that he can use us because we believe that Jesus can change us. And if we believe He can change us and we believe He can change the world, we also need to understand that Jesus can use us to influence the lives of others for Christ. 
Oh, that's so important for us to see. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to begin reading today in verse 4, and we'll make our way ultimately through verse 12 today. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, he says, As you come to Him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. All right, what I want us to look at as we begin in this passage is what we have, what we can have in Jesus Christ. He starts off in verse 4 with this phrase, as you come to Him. The first thing that we can have is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now we know this. We're familiar with this phrase. It's one thing to know about Jesus. We can know facts about Jesus. We can know facts about the Bible. Uh, In fact, if you'll allow me to use this term, we can know trivia about Jesus and even the Scriptures. It's one thing to know about Jesus. It's another thing to know Jesus. And so when we talk about coming to Christ, we're talking about believing in Him, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, repenting of our sins, being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. That's how we come into Christ. I'm reminded of the invitation that Jesus Himself offered in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, where He said, Come to Me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So Jesus even extended the invitation for us to come to Him. When we turn to Hebrews chapter 10, this is beautiful to see. In Hebrews chapter 10, there's this phrase, draw near to God, that is used several times throughout that chapter. At the beginning of the chapter, he talks about drawing near to God in worship. Now, and he's making the, the, the difference, and he's, he's helping us to understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We can come near to God in worship in the New Covenant because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. As we go down to verses 19 through 25, the Hebrew writer talks about drawing near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. He also will talk about holding unswervingly to the hope that we have. He brings that up again in Hebrews chapter 10. And here's the key. When you look in chapter 10, I believe it's verse 19. All of these things are available through Jesus. In fact, that's the whole point of the letter of Hebrews. It's to talk about that we have it better in Christ. Christ is greater than the angels in chapter 1. In chapter 2, he talks about he's greater than Moses. And he goes through and he's like, Jesus is better. He's a better high priest. He offered a better sacrifice. We can draw near to God because of our relationship in Jesus Christ. Back in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter describes Jesus as a stone. But he will go through and he continues to add to that picture. He will talk about Jesus as being a stone. Verse 4, the living stone. Verse 6, the chosen and precious stone. And then in verse 7, the cornerstone. That word cornerstone literally means to set the angles to set the angles. And we talked about this last week, that if Jesus is the cornerstone in our life, if we get Jesus right, then everything else is right. So we can have a relationship with Jesus Christ as you come to Him. Let's move to our next point. We can have access to God through Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, 
You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now let's think about the difference in the Old Testament versus the New. In the Old Testament, I'm reminded of this story from Exodus chapter 19 at Mount Sinai. As Moses is preparing to go up on the mountain, he'll ultimately receive the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament law while he's there. But as he prepares to go up, Exodus chapter 19 verse 12, God said, He said, put limits for the people around the mountain. And tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. And so people had to keep their distance. They could not go on the mountain or they would lose their life. There was limited access. And then when we think about the idea of the tabernacle, later the temple, that we know that certain people could only go so close. If you were a Gentile, you could only go this far. If you were an Israelite, you could only go this far. If you were a priest, you could only go this far. The most holy place, the holy of holies, only the high priest could go there. And only once a year to offer sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. You see, in the Old Testament, there was limited access to God. But I think about the role that we have now, that we are a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We're able to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So now, we have constant access. We can pray anytime we want. We can talk to God and we pray through Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. We have constant access to God in prayer through Jesus Christ. And then I think about our opportunity to worship. We don't have to bring sacrifices to a priest or to someone else to offer on our behalf. We are able to come and to lift our voices in a sacrifice of praise. As we go about our daily lives, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. But as we come to worship, we don't have to have someone else to worship for us. We don't have to go through someone else. Because of Jesus, we have access to God through Jesus Christ. We have a relationship with Christ. We have access to God through Christ. And the second thing that we can see is that we can have a faith that grows in Christ. First Peter chapter 2, verse 6 says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Friends, if we put our hope in Jesus, we will never be put to shame. Other translations say we will not be disappointed. And still other translations, we will not be deceived. I think about Judgment Day. And I think about how it's sad it's going to be on Judgment Day when so many other world religions are going to find out that their faith could have grown in God through Jesus Christ. But without Jesus, there is no hope. That's why we are a people who have hope, because we can have a relationship with Jesus. We can have access to God through Jesus. We can have a faith that grows in Christ, and we have a love that grows in Christ. Beautiful passage, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. I want to zero in on this idea that Jesus is our precious cornerstone. And I do that and I want to ask this question. 
how will the world know? How will the world know that we're Christians? Have you thought about that? We, we don't have a, a name tag with a label that we wear around. And even if we did, we, we know that that's not going to be just an accurate depiction. Just because I have a label that says I am a Christian, just because I wear a Christian t-shirt, just because I carry a Bible, that doesn't make me a Christian. How will the world know that we are Christians? Well, now there are a lot of possible answers, a lot of discussion that could be had. One of the answers I'll suggest to you is this, is when the world sees what is precious to us, what is valuable to us, what is important to us, everyone and everything else pales in comparison to our relationship with Jesus Christ. What was it that our Lord said? But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. You see, that's what's so important to me about worship. Because when we come to worship, we get to express to God what is important to us. The manner in which we worship, the excitement we have about being here, it says something about what's important to us. And so I ask you this morning, are you excited to be here, to be able to worship together? Or did someone have to drag you out of your room kicking and screaming? Or did you come out of guilt and, and, and just this, this sense of obligation that you have to sit down and check off this hour? Because, because that's not it. If Jesus is precious to us and our love for Christ is growing, then we want to be here. We want to worship. And in just a few moments, we'll gather around the table and we get to take the bread and we get to take the cup. And it's the reason we do that is because we want to remember the Lord's death until He comes. Why? Because our Lord is precious and what He did for us is that important. And so our love grows in Christ. Let's look now. I want us to go ahead and scoot ahead to verse 9, uh, just quickly if we can. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. The first phrase of that is, we are a chosen people. Friends, we have been chosen in Christ. I think about where we are today, and you sit here and say, well, Johnny, I, I chose to get up early. I chose to worship today. I am choosing to do this. And, I, and let me just express this. Everything we do today that is pleasing in God's eyes, as we worship, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, the lives we live, the things that we do, the things that are pleasing to God, it is our response for what God has done for us. You see, we were chosen. God made the first move. Because of our sin, we were separated from God. And there wasn't anything we could do about it. Nothing. But God made the first move. What is it that Romans chapter 5 says? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 reminds us, God made the first move. We have been chosen in Christ. And then I also need us to look, same verse, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Here's the point of all of that. We've been set up heart in Christ. We've been called to be holy. That word literally means to be set apart. So what does it mean that we're set apart from the world? Where well, we're set apart because the world should look at us. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So the world can know and recognize there's something different about us. Even an old Japanese commander can recognize the difference in Christians because of our love for one another, our compassion 
for one another. How we care for those that are, as Scripture would describe, the least of these. Our compassion for one another and the way that we forgive one another. Those are just a, a few of the things that set us apart from the rest of the world. Man, the world's going to look at us and say, Man, how, how can people love like that? How can people have compassion like that? How, how can you Christians forgive like that? We've been set apart in Christ. All right, let's review this. We have been, we have opportunity to have a relationship with Christ, to have access to God through Christ, to have a faith that grows, to have a love that grows, because we have been chosen. God made the first move, and we've been set apart. We want to live different, distinct lives. People recognize the difference. So we need to ask this question. This is the so what question. What difference does it make? Uh, what is our, our proper response? What's the whole point of all of this? All right. I want us to go back. We're going to read verses 9 through 12. We're not much longer. I want us to read verses 9 through 12. And here's the deal. As we read through, look for the word that. Uh, some translations, I think, say so that. But what we're looking for is the word that. All right? Let's go through and look. But you were a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That, got it, right? that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. So, what's the point? Why do we want to live lives this way? Well, there, there's two things. The first one we find in, in chapter 2, verse 9, where he says that, i see if I've, I've got that. No, I don't. I thought I had that slide there. Chapter 2, verse 9, he says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Friends, we have something to tell. We, with our speech, with the things we say, the way we worship, the way we declare, the way that we, uh, the, just the language that we use, it says something about us. We can tell what Christ has done for us. And then when we go to verse 12, when we go to verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans. You see, it's not just what we say, but it's what we do. It's not just what we tell, it's how we live. We have opportunity as we leave and as we go about our daily activities to show that we belong to Jesus, to show that we're Christians, to let our light shine. People can look at us and they can tell a difference. And if people that are being persecuted can have an influence on an old brutal Japanese commander, I can't help but think that God's people today can have an influence, beginning in our families and in our community. And in a world that's filled, even a community that at times can be filled with anger and division over so many things that are going on around us today. Friends, we can make a difference. Jesus can make a difference in my life and in your life, but He can also use us to make a difference in the lives of those around us. I want to leave you with this. Perhaps you saw this as I brought it up just a few seconds ago. I remember this phrase from a, a time when I was a child and a teenager. That as we were in our teenage Sunday school class, someone uh, gave a lesson one day, an incredible point that it made for me, and it stayed with me over the years. If you were arrested for being a Christian, 
would they have enough evidence to convict you? If you were arrested for being a, conv- a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you? I think about us being there in a position where we're being, being accused of this, and different witnesses are being brought up on the witness stand, and people begin to ask them questions. Would some people respond by going, he's a Christian? I, I didn't know that. See, that's the last thing that we would want. We, we would want that people say, yeah, I, I, I knew he was a Christian. I knew he was great. I could tell by the way that he talked. I could tell by his outlook on life. I could tell by his faith in God. I could tell by the way he treated other people. It was evident in every aspect of his life. Yeah, he's a Christian. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you? Friends, I hope so. And I hope that that evidence is used. That just in the same way that Jesus has changed our lives, I hope that you will use that evidence, others around us, to be able to influence them through the gospel of Jesus Christ.